Welcome to the Center for Brains, Minds and Machines. My name is Viktor Munarski, I'm a postdoc here, and today is my great pleasure to host our guest speaker, Joe Litzier from University of Sydney. Thank you, Victor. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So, Joe, you work in the field of complex systems and complexity, uh, which is a relatively new field compared to perhaps other fields in science, although it also has its history right now. Uh, could you tell us a few words about its place in the landscape of modern science and what are the questions it, it's attempting to answer? Sure. I mean, we might start with where it came from, actually. So, uh, complex systems as a field crystallized in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. It came out of uh, related fields like chaos theory, like cybernetics, like dynamical systems and systems theory. It came at a time when people were, were starting to ask questions, sort of higher level questions about the systems they were looking at. They were, they were asking questions about uh, what makes collective behavior of a system different to what's happening at the individual level. Mm -hmm. They're asking questions about, uh, in neuroscience for example, about consciousness questions that you just can't answer at that individual level and you also need people from different fields to, to come together to, to look at those questions. And so it started crystallizing uh, in that time and around those questions and uh, to, to kind of formalize what complex systems means. It's all about these concepts of, of emergence and self-organization and collective behavior. Uh, complex systems is the study of how uh, the collective behavior at a system level is a result of the interactions at, of the elements at some lower level, uh, in particular how it's a, a non-trivial result of those interactions at the lower level. So the goals of complex systems are, are really about uh, understanding how collective behavior emerges from those lower level behaviors, and not just understanding, but looking at design as well, which uh, uh, for, um, uh, for biological neural networks, we're not so much looking at design right now, but for artificial neural networks, we certainly are. And so that's, uh, that's where it comes from, and, and, and they are the high-level goals. And we use approaches from different fields. We use agent-based modeling. We use information theory. We use, uh, uh, we use network science or complex networks or graph theory to a very large extent, uh, and even game theory as well to, to try and achieve that goal of understanding how we go from that, those microscopic interactions to the macroscopic systems-level emergent behavior. The particular focus of yours is information theory and application of information theory to understanding of complex systems. Mm -hmm. uh, what type of insight can we expect to get from application of the tools that you develop and work with uh, to understanding of natural complex systems? That's a very good question. Uh, I see information theory as a very natural fit to the way we look at complex systems. And this is because uh, the concepts that information theory considers align very naturally with the, the qualitative way that people describe how complex systems operate. Uh, this is kind of probably best summed up by a quote from uh, Murray Gell-Mann, the, uh, the Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize winner who was one of the founders of, of complex systems. He had, and I'm sure I'm gonna garble this quote, but he, he said uh, that different complex systems resemble each other in the way they handle information. And so, studying the way they handle information is perhaps the best starting point for analyzing complex systems. As I say, I've garbled the quote, but you, you understand my point. And I completely agree with that perspective, because in complex systems, we talk a lot about how different parts of the system share information, how they communicate information, how they operate on information. For example, when we look at uh, flocks of birds or schools of fish, we talk about how, uh, how, how one fish may see a predator and react, and then uh, its turn kind of spreads that information across the, the, the flock or, or, or school of fish, and we see a wave of information across the fish. We also talk about how the fish have some kind of collective memory about where they're heading. All of these terms uh, are talking about operations on information, yet they're qualitative. Information theory offers us a quantitative way to start to analyze how we, how we uh, can understand and think about complex systems in this way. So it's a very naturally aligned with the, these qualitative descriptions. Not only that, it offers us uh, a, a very nice universal way of analyzing these, these different kinds of systems. One of the key stumbling blocks in complex systems, and in particular, uh, this has been raised by, by Barabashi about complex network uh, analysis. One of the big stumbling blocks that we have is that our systems come from so many different fields. So the data that we can analyze, that we want to analyze, uh, has many different properties across these fields. We could be looking at Boolean data from uh, uh, models of gene, gene regulatory networks. 
We could be looking at uh, continuous value data from brain images. We could be looking at spiking data from neural spike recordings. They're all very different kinds of data. But information theory can be used with different kinds of estimators to answer exactly the same questions, to look at information flow, for example, in exactly the same way across all these kinds of data sets. So putting those two together, it's not only aligns with the way we think about complex systems and describe it qualitatively, but quantitatively, it allows us to do things across these kinds of systems, which is exactly what complex systems wants to do. We want to be looking for similarities across different kinds of systems. And to extend that, it's also a nonlinear tool uh, and it's model free. So those properties all together make it what I think is, is a perfect tool for complex systems analysis. In terms of what it can do after that, uh, it probably entered complex systems uh, more from the way it could allow us to quantify uncertainty. So the fundamental measure from information theory is entropy. And that aligned very well with the way people were describing complex systems as a, a mixture of order, order behavior and chaotic behavior. Because entropy obviously allows us to quantify uh, order in a system as well as uh, disorder uh, in, in uncertainty. So that's probably how it came in. But these days it's being more used uh, from an information perspective, looking at uh, relationships between entities in the complex system and modeling those relationships uh, quantifying how strong relationships between different components are, in particular helping us with this bottom-up view. Uh, as I said before, the complex systems uh, studies the way interactions within the complex system uh, relate to behavior at the systems level. Studying interactions and relationships, which information theory uh, naturally does, uh, is a really good fit for information theory to help us understand those relationships in the system and how they give rise to system level behavior. Uh, we are sitting here at MIT, which is a particularly important place in the history of information theory uh, due to work and presence of Claude Shannon, his father, who was first a graduate student here uh, and then for many years faculty. What I'm tempted to ask you is how did the field evolve since Shannon's original, uh, t since Shannon's times and his original work? And um, what are the differences between the perspective that you take and on information theory? and uh, Shannon and his contem contemporaries might have had. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really glad you raised that. It's, it's such an honor to be here in uh, you know, the halls that Shannon walked and uh, you know, I've read so much of his writing. It's wonderful to sort of have that context and, and see where he was. Uh, you're absolutely right. Information theory has moved in a very large way since those early days. Uh, I guess what we represent is very much the application of that theory beyond telecommunications. So starting to look at natural communications in the natural world and natural information processing. What's interesting about that is that Shannon actually wrote a paper uh, in the mid to late 1950s called The Bandwagon, where he actually uh, got kind of cranky about people taking information theory and applying it in this way. He sort of said, you know, I've developed this for telecommunications. That's where it makes sense. That's where we should leave it. And it's important to understand that that was not an opinion that was 100% uh, agreed with across the field. There was a lot of pushback about that. And certainly we're on the side of the pushback. Now, I don't know what Shannon concluded many years later. Hopefully he concluded that it was suitable to be used in these other areas. Um, but certainly that, that's our opinion. Uh, so in, in, in applying it to natural computation uh, and, and natural communication and information processing, I guess we are taking very much a, a statistical view of what Shannon's measures meant. Uh, and our view is certainly that uh, we can interpret the measures, we can interpret uh, mutual information as information that's commonly held between two variables in any system. It doesn't have to be a telecommunications system. And from where I'm standing, that's the, the major way uh, information theory has changed. It can be developed, it can be uh, used in so many different fields and not just in, in biology, uh, even in machine learning, for example, uh, mutual information is a very common measure for feature selection. All of these are very different uh, to where information theory grew up. Uh, in terms of how the, the fundamental theory has changed, uh, as well as how its applications have changed, there's been a lot of work happening there as well. Uh, partly uh, in numerical estimation, obviously in uh, the contemporary era, uh, you know, we're all focusing on, on data analysis. There's so much data to be analyzed now, particularly in computational neuroscience. Uh, and so obviously information theory has changed somewhat in terms of how we can, uh, how we can use it to analyze data sets. 
So there's been a lot of work in uh, uh, producing better estimators, for example, so we can, uh, we can produce more accurate measures of information so that we can handle uh, both big and small data sets and understand uh, statistical significance of the measures that we are looking at. Another area I'd like to highlight is that uh, is in terms of theoretical development that information theory allows. By being able to properly quantify information, we can now form theories in, in completely different fields and bring information theory in uh, in order to form those theories properly. So we could, we could form higher, higher level theories about information processing in the brain and actually quantify what, what we mean if we talk about having a theory of uh, that information should be transferred from area A to area B in a certain task. We can quantify that and have a, a larger theory built around information theory. Uh, another application that I think is, is very important to measure, not so much an application, another direction that it's changing in, is what's currently called as information decomposition. This is a very hot part of information theory at, at the moment. Uh, what that's looking at is trying to, uh, I guess, backfill some parts of the theory that, that weren't there from the beginning. Uh, what information uh, decomposition is trying to do, we can, we can summarize in a, in, a, in a simple example. If we think about uh, the information that two variables hold about some target variable, let's call these two source variables, we might want to ask, uh, what do both of those source variables hold in common about the target? We might want to ask, what does source A know about the target that source B does not, or vice versa? Or we might want to ask, what do we find out from the two sources together about the target that we can't get from either source alone? And that's what we call the synergy. So we might want to ask about redundant information, unique information from each source or synergistic information. That's four quantities. Information theory, it seems, only gives us three. We could ask about what information the first, source, first source tells us about the target, what information the second source tells us about the target, or what they tell us together. So we might want to ask four things, but we've got three things we can measure. So you've got a fundamental algebraic problem. Trying to get a new constraint for information theory to provide answers to all those four questions has been a very hot area, and it's still an area under debate. I think my student, Connor Finn, has solved it, but that's still an area of controversy in the field. A lot of people think that their measure solves it in a better way, so that's something that we're trying to talk about a lot and trying to get to, trying to, get to solve because we think that can unlock uh, a raft of new applications uh, for information theory in the future. So it's certainly still a dynamic field. It's still a lot of engagement uh, and still a lot of debate. Exciting times. Indeed. The central theme behind the work at the Center for Brains, Minds and Machines, CBMM, uh, is intelligence as implemented by artificial systems, uh, but also biological systems, primarily brains. Um, could you share with us a perspective of a complex system researcher on the notion of intelligence and what does this field can contribute to our understanding of it? Sure. So as a, as a complex system scientist, understanding the brain, understanding intelligence, understanding consciousness is kind of almost a holy grail of what we would like our field to be able to contribute to. So looking at intelligence, I would say that complex systems takes a very holistic view uh, of looking at the, the emergence of intelligence from, uh, firstly from the emergence, of, the emergence of intelligence from the interaction between billions of neurons and how, how can we understand how that scales up from, from neurons to circuits to, uh, to regions and systems and, and in the brain as a whole. So we want to think about uh, intelligence emerging from those collective interactions. We want to think about uh, intelligence emerging from uh, information interactions and information processing in those systems. We also want to think about uh, the emergence of intelligence from uh, the complex network structure of the brain. So that's a very large fo focus of complex systems, science and intelligence, looking at network structure. And also thinking about the emergence of intelligence from development. So another uh, aspect of complex systems that I didn't mention before is thinking about uh, evolution uh, as well as adaptation of systems. Uh, and so uh, thinking about not just uh, natural intelligence but artificial intelligence as well. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, one recent trend has been in, in machine uh, learning has been the, the re-emergence of genetic algorithms, actually. So now looking at GAs for uh, breeding uh, intelligent systems, whereas before it was much more about multi-agent uh, systems. 
So just to summarize that, uh, as I say, our view as complex system scientists is very much about, uh, about emergence, looking at intelligence through that lens, the lens of uh, emergence through collective interactions, information processing, complex networks, and, uh, and development. In terms of what we can contribute, uh, I guess just taking uh, an example from my own work, looking at information theory and, and measuring information processing in complex systems. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope that uh, what we're doing in, in, in uh, uh, looking at information processing in complex systems helps illuminate how intelligence uh, emerges in this way. So we can use our tools to analyze uh, when and where information is, is, is being transferred from region A to region B, for example, at which times, how does that relate to a cognitive task? How can we ask uh, when and where information is being non-trivially combined? So we could identify when and where, say, visual and audio information is being combined to, to make a non-trivial decision. And hopefully all of those pieces will contribute uh, to an understanding of intelligence. Joe, thanks so much for taking time to talk to us today and for traveling this long distance to give a talk here. We are very much looking forward to hearing you later today. Thanks for coming. Thank you. It was a pleasure to chat with you, Victor.